Sharon, thank you very much for joining me today on the Pull Up a Chair podcast. Um, we're going to explore the challenges and opportunities around responsible and ethical growth, and in particular, um, in a way that meets the needs of people, planet and profit. And I'm really excited because as chair of the John Lewis Partnership, with your background in as, an, as a regulator at Ofcom, and years of experience in the civil service and government, it's going to be an interesting conversation when we look at all the sort of stakeholder lenses. So thank you very much for joining me today. It's, it's beyond fantastic to, to be here. It's just such a privilege. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to start with a very with a question I ask everybody. You know, what does sustainable growth mean to you? Um, I, mean, I think the whole topic of today, I think, is um, is, is fascinating because... There's a there's been a real debate about whether there is somehow a sort of trade off between being a sort of purpose purpose led or values driven uh, business and one that's commercially um, super super successful, and whether you call it sustainable growth, whether you call it sort of purpose and profit, um, for me the sweet spot is that you've got a sort of commercial business that doesn't just have sort of purpose or sustainability on the side, but it's a massive driver for the commercial success. And that might be through different routes. It might be because actually, I mean, I, you know, I could talk a bit about the partnership. It might be because um, actually your people are drawn to work with a business that is not just about profit, but wants to be more active and positive in the community or the, the driving exigency of net zero and climate change. It might be because actually you're you're jolting and disrupting your customers that actually I could I could buy a lipstick or a sofa with anybody, but actually I'm buying it with you because there's something that's that's different and not perfect, but you're trying to play a part. And I think um, I mean this is a broad broader commentary I think about where where the state is at the moment, but I think business has never had uh, a more important role than in the public policy space than today. Back in, I think it was earlier this year in May 2023, you and I both spoke at the Fostering Network. And that was a really important event because it also launched the government's policies around fostering and people in and out, um, outside of that. And what really struck me was your passion for societal impact. So it comes through in the way that you talk about that. And I know that you, John Lewis, as we have, have implemented policies specifically focused on that community of underrepresented who don't necessarily have access. I just really wanted to understand your perspective around that and really how do you think, or do you really think it's possible to balance that need of planet and people as well as yeah, profit? That's a great question. And actually, sort of, I mean, we met each other for the first time and... Um, I mean, I was blown away both by the job you're doing, but also your passion. So, um, you know, so it's one of those sort of serendipitous moments of connection. I, I mean, I might answer your question in a slightly broader piece because I think, I think even net zero is not a done deal and a one argument. And I think one of the things I'm uh, thoughtful, quite worried about is what's happened over the last six, nine months in which... Um, even the sort of environmental agenda has got caught into sort of the culture walls, that somehow uh, you're deemed to be progressive, not progressive, insufficiently commercial, insufficiently focused on shareholder return, that you're concerned about the planet. And so I think it's a, even that's a good reminder that um, these sort of battles and arguments have to be sort of continually sort of focused on one. And it's one of the reasons I, I talk a bit about sort of common sense capitalism as a bit of an an, sort of antidote to um, you know the whole sort of virtues, virtue signalings of woke capitalism nonsense in my view um, I mean your question about sort of social impact in, in a way um, in a way I've been very lucky because my my passion in life is this um, I mean, partly my background in that, uh, as you know, I'm, my parents are Windrush generation. My, um, I mean, my mother, woo, who went, left school when she was 10, 11, having not really been to school very much during the primary school years. My dad did a bit better, left school at 15. So I feel I had massive privilege in my life that I, I was able to go to school because they emigrated and I was able to go to university and I managed to work all in a not in a manual job all things that my parents were unable to do 
So I have a personal sort of, um, I don't know, mission's too strong, but it's where my heart is. And it's one of the reasons why I've basically been in the public sector for so long before coming to the <laughs> partnership. And then the partnership, interestingly, is also, um, I mean, some, some people talk about it being founded on communist principles or a sort of socialist version of capitalism. But it was basically set up as an alternative to capitalism. So the idea of partners, you, you know, you own a stake in the business or a tr sort of trust settlement. The idea is that you would treat workers so well that you wouldn't have to become a communist after the Second World War. So we, we had universal health care before the NHS. And so sort of fast forward into the, our joint interest, which is um, for the partnership or for KPMG to be a home for people poor young people who've never had a home, had broken education backgrounds, my parents, you know, our backgrounds not not that dissimilar, um, who somebody has not been looking out for them, who they reach the age of 18 and suddenly the state steps back, social worker-wise, home-wise, um, that we can step in and say, you know what, we'd love to give you a job and we'll put our arms around you. And when something goes wrong, because it will go wrong, we'll step in and, you know, when you lose your home, classic partnership will basically sort of step in, try to organise accommodation. I've got a team in Trafford who's been decorating the home of one of our partners who's come in from the care system because he, he lost his home. So it's the, it's the personal and the professional for me are, um, yeah, are, are sort of super, super integrated. And that's really important because what you're saying is, you know, you're giving a, you're giving these colleagues uh, or uh, partners mm. a place of belonging where they can thrive, thrive in an environment they wouldn't have had access mm. to. And it's really interesting because I see that through the work of the KPMG Foundation, which is, you know, how we do it, you know, about to working with children in a, on the edge of care and how do you help that next step. So thank you to you and John Lewis for doing what you do for, for that particular community because I do think it's a community that we don't really necessarily wrap our arms yeah, around. I couldn't agree more but don't underestimate your personal impact as well as the impact of the organisation it's huge. Um, you've worked in government, regulator and business and I think the answer is no but I'd love <laughs> to ask you do you think your perspective and your view of sustainable growth has changed because I think underlying all of this is what you've just talked about but I'd just be interested to see if that's Change. Yeah, I think it, I, you know, I was, I mean, I was in the civil service for more than 20 years, almost 30 years. I was a regulator for five years and I've been in business for um, four years. I think what's changed is, um, and I had a lot, uh, an awful, I had a lot to do with business when I was at the Treasury sort of preparing budgets. Um, and obviously a lot to do with business when I was uh, regulating the media and telecoms and, and post. Um, but a very particular relationship based on really how do you get strong consumer interest while also having incentives to grow and invest. I probably now see the role of business in society differently, even than when I was a regulator and then even when I was in government. And I think that is a commentary um, to be frank on where the state is today. And I think this is not a party political mm. point, but if you look at the last few years, it's been very difficult for governments to make progress. I mean, partly the pandemic and cost of living crunch, but it's also because I think it's a more divided society. I think politics has become more divisive from the days when I, you know, I worked for the worked for everybody. I mean, when I, when I became a civil servant, Margaret Thatcher was still prime minister. So I've worked for the Conservatives. I've worked for, I worked for Tony Blair and New Labour. I've worked for the coalition government. I've worked for the Conservatives again. So I've seen all strands. And I think when I was in government, there was definitely more commonality between the parties of those who were around the cabinet table. And to be frank, you know, they left their tribalism behind, probably more in common in terms of fiscal outlook, economic outlook, societal outlook, probably fiscally conservative and quite socially liberal. I think that consensus has started to break down, which is why I think it's been much harder for, for government to have a really coherent 
economic framework. I mean, the obviously the the Liz Truss um, uh, budget, gosh, just over this time last year has yeah. been a sort of you know very sharp example of that. And so, actually, if if I were if I were if I were worried about the care community, I wouldn't be looking to government. I'd be looking to KPMG. I'd be looking to business to step in if I was concerned about infrastructure spend. You know, look at the yeah. high speed two route from Old Old Oak Common to Euston. That's pr- private private sector money developing jobs and homes and sustainable communities. So I think my view has changed because of the last period of time when I think government has has almost become sort of anaesthetized because the politics have become so difficult. And I think it then is more beholden on business and then for business to navigate this very, very difficult political terrain, which is where the whole sort of culture wars and how you stay on the right side of uh, consumers, your customers, your shareholders, um, even as you're wanting to be more socially uh, useful. And that's a really interesting way of putting it, Sharon, because you're, I think if we look at business, even the Edelman Trust and the role in, of business in society, I'd like to just unpick that a little bit more because I think with the complexity of the changes around us, with the inequality we've talked about, with the growth of technology and AI, these the skills that we need for the future have to shift quite fast. And government alone can't do that because it, that's a sort of a decade cycle rather than years as we as we experience, right? And on top of that, um, your business and our business also has this intergenerational facet where you've got colleagues that cross, you know, from Gen X all the way down to Gen Alpha. So um, I just wanted to explore a little bit about um, how business can work with government. How do you think we can work better? What would what would help us kind of really co- coalesce around those common purposes? Yeah. So I'm fascinated by the intergenerational piece. Um, uh, and I'm fascinated because we are a, we have a historic legacy business. So long-standing customers, lots of loyalty to a model that's now having to modernise. Um, we definitely have a, a complexity. Uh, it is probably fair to say that our partners are probably more progressive, um, if you want to use the term, more liberal, possibly than some of our customers. And so how you have a, an agenda that's inclusive that is not alienating to your customers. Um, so every time we do a pride event, um, I always get a number of customers who are really concerned that the business is becoming politicised. And at the same time, I've got partners who are uh, saying for the first time they feel free and safe to be by themselves. So working all of that through, yeah, that inter- 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 intergenerational, but also just sort of that political spectrum point, I think is super important. Um, relationship with governments. I think, I, would, I think the relationship with government is... Um, Super important and at the moment uh, super difficult. And it's not difficult because individuals aren't reaching out and because there isn't a common, you talk about common purpose or common agenda. Of course, everybody wants to tackle low productivity, low growth, and some of the big infrastructure issues, skills, education, you know, what, what what's the next stage of our relationship with Europe, etc. I think what's difficult at the moment with business is we don't, we don't quite know what the agenda is that we're docking into. Um, so now I'm sure it's the same for KPMG. We as a business, we we work on particular issues with the government, including care leavers. I'm yep. a big thing at the moment about shop, shop lifting, um, where we are actually talking very constructively to the government about the fact that there's not it's not legislation in the in England and Wales that there is in Scotland that makes it a specific offence to abuse and attack a shop worker. Huge issue for us, a uh, huge issue in terms of safety, huge issue commercially. And so there are definitely sort of important segments and issues that we've got a really good open door. That's different from uh, really understanding what the broader economics tax plan, tax strategy, future of the high street, um, attitude to foreign direct investment, mm-hmm. 
Uh, I was talking, I was in Italy for slightly madly for a, a day and a half last weekend. Fascinating to go to Milan now. Absolutely fascinating. Um, high speed rail, masses of investment. I was at a session at Bocconi University, which is a big, as you know, big sort of MBA um, economics of powerhouse. And I was talking to um, a, a, a colleague about the fact that the Italian government has just introduced uh, new tax subsidies for PhD students. A PhD, um, if you've got a, a doctoral, those who've got doctorates, that you essentially only pay tax on 10% of your income, which has basically now driven this huge uh, talent, international talent, um, reconstruction, infrastructure build. And I just thought that was the most sort of fantastically sort of interesting talisman example for a, a, a government, a country that, that's really new skills. And so I'm, I'm, I guess I'm sort of optimistic, whoever wins, whoever, assuming there's an election next year, um, and whoever wins the election, whichever party, that that's an opportunity to have a, a coherent, electorally backed, economic, business friendly strategy that, that we can coalesce around. I think that's absolutely right, because I, th um, I, I think the attraction of talent and being creative with our policies. So I think we're entering a phase where the way we do business, the way government sets policies will change. And it will change forever because we are uh, at collectively working um, to face into some difficult challenges in environment. And as a UK, we've got growth challenges. And you've talked about productivity, housing, mm. education, etc. All these quite complex and gritty and difficult things to deal with. I mean, they're difficult and they're easy. <laughs> I mean, they're difficult because nobody likes change. Yeah. But they're easy. I mean, we know housing needs effort and targets and a different planning regime that I mean it's, it's not that we don't know what the playbook is mm. the, the issue is will and um, and being prepared to have a few scars on your back yeah absolutely um, I just wanted to explore a little bit about the intergenerational mm. uh, concept you know, with, within within the business that you lead um, you're facing you've got a, a large work for how many 74,000 74,000 partners um, you joined the organization I think because you at the time you might have said that you know you wanted to work with something that's got of kinder capitalism yes, exactly. um, you know sort of commercial purpose as much as the social and sort of how do you get commercial excellence and social mm -hmm. purpose I just wanted to just understand from you how you see that because you're entrusted with the sustainable and viable growth of an organisation, as you said, has been around for many, many years, that these new partners who are probably just entering into your, your workforce will then inherit from you. So just wanted to understand how, you know, what you hear from them, how you see that journey. Yeah, again, it's a, it's a brilliant question because although, I mean, I'm called chairman and I think if anybody sort of is in a classic conventional business, um, it really doesn't, <laughs> the role doesn't translate. Um, so the the chair or the chairman's role is, is essentially it's, in, it's it's set out in trust, which has got the sort of force of primary legislation. And my responsibility is ultimately that there is a uh, a partnership, so an employee-owned business, not just in the next five years, but in the next hundred years. Uh, we talk in the partnership about sort of distinctive character, which is quite sort of jargony, but it means. Um, it's not enough for us to um, be commercially successful, and we need to be more commercially successful than we are today, but that we've got to do that in a way that is kinder, more humane. The, the founder of the partnership, Speed and Lewis, talked about decency, and we've got a mission which is about making the world a happier place. We have a constitution, yep. 34 page constitution, that explicitly forbids us from making maximum profit so our constitution says uh, the job of the partnership is to uh, make quote sufficient profit to do good so it's, it's it's a profoundly different perspective and as you say the perspective of the chairman is bloody hell yes we've got to, we've got to survive the next you know 18 months two years because of coming through a cost of living crunch etc but my perspective is is literally a hundred years, yeah. Uh, and so we we're doing some things which is 
for reasons I never quite understand, is regarded being quite controversial. So we, we've got a big new line of business around bill to rent, mm. which if we were simply thinking about how do we maximise cash flow over the next two to three years, we wouldn't be in. Um, but we want to do two things. We want to have a societal impact on housing. And also, I've, I've got to give consideration to the balance sheet, not in the next five years, but in the next 10, 15, 20 years, not least because we've got a really significant generous pension scheme that needs you know, growing assets to be bad. Um, it makes you think about culture very differently. So this intergenerational point for us is, I mean, I know lots of businesses have this, but it's fascinating for us because long tenure has always been really important in the partnership. You know, being a, you join at 16, maybe with no qualifications, but you join your local store, you work, work your way up to branch manager, and maybe you retire at 60 or 65, but in, or indeed you have flexible retirement and you might work in the partnership till you're 75. And I've got partners who've been in the business for 60 years, 50 years, 40 years, every weekend I write long service letters and it takes me maybe three quarters of an hour to write my 25 year service letters. 25 years, you get six months full pay to take leave and explore the world. So that sense of community longevity for a different labor market model when it was a job for life now hits with a change. So actually our benefits need to be more flexible because you might be with us for two or three years and actually the most important thing is not that you've got long leave in 25 years but that actually you get an apprenticeship scheme or um, training and development to become an amazing meat buyer or wine buyer. And so I often think about the, the job, is I used to work on social, social security reform um, when I was in government which is a classic intergenerational how do you make change? How do you ensure that the losers are really well protected, transitional protected? How do you make sure that people coming new into the system also feel they've got a stake and buying? And it is the most fantastic and the most difficult change set of changes to make, particularly when we're not sufficiently profitable always to, to buy out those who are feeling that they're losing. And so for me, you can only, we can only step forward and we're doing it imperfectly at the moment by drawing on a sense of responsibility and duty. So at the moment, I talk a lot about the partnership being a house. You know, so you were renting the house for 20 years and that was nice, but now you've saved money to buy the house. Same house, same roof, maybe the same furniture, but it's your house. And you don't know why it's different, but you feel a sense of pride, you know, literally ownership and commitment that you didn't feel before. And guess what? The roof needs fixing. And I'm not calling on Bina to fix the, house, the roof. I'm calling on myself to fix the roof. And so for me, the, the, the way to somehow navigate this intergenerational pull, tension, opportunity is by drawing on a sense of responsibility, whether you've been in the business for 60 years or whether you're planning to be in the business for 60 months or six months, it's our house and we've, and we've got a roof that needs fixing and, and how do we pull together? This long-term decision-making mm. for good yes. in its broadest sense, but also having to face into the challenges, short-term decisions, and we, you know, we've talked about it. You talked about the, you know, the economic environment, shoplifting. There's lots of things as a business you're having to face into today, and that takes a lot of resilience, Sharon. Yes. How does being an employee-owned organisation help or help in that? Because I guess there is a sense of common purpose. Does that help? Yeah, it definitely helps. So there's definitely the sense of common purpose, and. Um... I think it's always different when you're sort of a shopper with the brands because we mm. show up in a particular way. But if you work in the business, actually the, the conversations that you're most likely to have that are um, the partners are probably most passionate about are really about community and yeah. and belonging. I mean, of course, you know, we love, you know, it's Christmas coming and every retailer's, you know, it's a very exciting time. We've got great product. 
But I'm in shops every week and actually the most um, profound conversations come in two varieties. Um, either something's happened to that partner, um, they may have got ill, something's happened with their family and they've got the most amazing story about how the partnership has stepped in. And I've got every day I get, you know, I get probably three or four emails from partners saying, I'm so grateful for the partnership. I had cancer for six months and uh, you gave me six months paid leave. And when I came back, the team were amazing and they cooked for me every day. And the team sort of allowed me to come back flexibly. So there were those stories. And there's another stream of stories, which is Sharon, somebody came in and they used to shop with us and they can't afford to shop with us anymore. And, um, and so we all gathered round and we did a food parcel for them. And those are the two, and the, you know, it is, I sort of, I mean, I, I just, almost every day, I'm, I, I, there's, a, there's a moment in which I think, oh, there's something in my eye. Um, because they're, they're really pulling moments. Um, the, I guess the converse side of an employee-owned business is, and we've had a little bit of this, is sort of sometimes it, paradoxically, it can make it harder for you to, to, to invest long term. Because what I want to do today, I, you know, I would love to do another cost of living payment mm. for my teams this year. But actually, I know the, 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 the right thing to do for the business is to invest in technology, which is underinvested in, is to invest in data. Things that aren't necessarily, they're not very sexy, uh, they're not very visible. And um, we talk a lot about trade-offs. There's a lot that I'm trying to do in terms of transparency about the business and where we are commercially and, you know, with all the other, you know, amazing things that we're trying to do. Because the easiest thing to do would be to say, um, actually, we're going to have a bonus next year. So the business externally, internally is defined for success on whether we pay a bonus or not. And I've said we'll pay a bonus when it's affordable, but it's not the top of the list. And these are the challenges, right? Coming back to that commercial excellence, because you need to be successful and commercially profitable in order to reinvest in not just in technology, but also your colleagues, right? And whether it's through bonuses or training or skills. And that trade-off is a very difficult thing to have. And I guess your employee-owned structure is really what drives the culture. But as you, yeah, it, it does. I mean, it, I get a real sense of a, um, a very... Uh, Belonging, we use the word belonging, but loosely, but it is a very belonging culture, whether it's belonging to help each other or, or customers. As you sort of look forward and you think about some of the headwinds that the retail sector, the UK, geopolitically we face into, do you think that's likely to change? Gosh, um, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, my, a bit of my version of that question is... Uh, if, if we were setting up a partnership today, would we set it up in retail? Um, so as I was saying before, we're 74,000 partners, we're 21 million customers, 12 and a half billion pounds of revenue in a business where uh, both today's headwinds, but also just margins are tighter. Yeah. Uh, I mean, margins on the, so we're two thirds Waitrose, one third John Lewis Department Store. I mean, uh, margins in grocery halved overnight in 2009-2010 when Aldi and Lidl came into the market, the discounters came into the market. So you're, so you're basically, you're driving a business that's employee-owned, uh, trying to remain a distinctiveness that's commercial to your customers, essentially by saying, we've got great quality, great sustainability, this amazing model, uh, and we're premium because of those things at a time when, every, when everybody's more cost conscious. Um, and I think it is absolutely doable and it's also a really complex road to navigate. Um, so, you know, as, you're, as you'll know, because it was, you know, became quite public earlier this year, this question about how does the partnership fund itself? Um, we're a 12 and a half billion pound business with no external shareholder. Um, we're not going to ask our partners average pay. So the, the typical partner is a part-time Waitrose um, retail worker, probably on 18, 19, 20,000 pounds a year. We're not going to say, 
please, we want to invest in, I don't know, um, convenience, new convenience stores. So that question about how we fund ourselves as a partnership that wants to grow, that wants to invest back in our people, wants to invest back in skills, but also wants to, to go into new avenues for our customers is really complicated. And the most straightforward way for us to fund ourselves is obviously through the cash that we generate. But inflation, inflation's been 16% the last you know, 18 months. And so this question in which we were exploring, you know, you lose control if you have an external partner, but is that a possibility in some areas of our business? And we've done a version of this. So the Ocado, when we wanted to go into online grocery for Waitrose, we didn't do it by ourselves. We set up essentially a private company. Um, the partnership was a was a, a shareholder in that, a share that we sold um, a little while ago. So there were routes through, but you've got to look really creatively because otherwise the business will stagnate for lack of capital. Um, and we took on a lot of debt in the 2000s, 2010s, when we were grow we grew the business threefold. Waitrose doubled doubled uh, John Lewis both store footprint and online. So actually, I'm very cautious, not least given what's happened with interest rates. Yeah, and, uh, interest rates facing retailers to take on more debt. So it's a it's like everything in the partnership. It's a brilliant and complicated puzzle. And that's what I was trying to allude to, you know, so everything that makes John Lewis and Waitrose two of the best love brands in the UK and what it stand, what these stand for also for the longer term, you know, you're having to challenge that all the time. You're constantly having to unpick bits, maybe put them back together. And and I guess that that's an evolution, but I think particularly for you as, a, as an organisation. Um, and just as, as you sort of reflect on, I mean, you know, leadership, and we think about leadership qualities of what we've had in the past, but actually as we're facing into, and you've started to talk about a lot of these things, how would you describe, um, what, what would you say are the sort of the key leadership qualities apart from resilience? Yeah. <laughs> as we look forward, what do you think is really going to be important? Yeah, I think, uh, and we've talked a bit about this, I think if you're, you know, in the roles that we do, they've got more complicated. Um, I mean, they're amazing jobs, incredibly privileged. They've become much more multifaceted. And um, Camilla, the piece that Camilla Cavendish did a few months ago in the FT really struck with me. Um, when she talked about, you know, every business now needs a sort of chief political officer. Because <laughs> you're sort of, you know, you've got, um, it is a much more complicated stakeholder terrain. So when you think about the team, and we've both got great teams around us, when you think about, um, you, the, as you say, it's not just the, the, the strategy and the vision for the business has got to connect commerciality with purpose. That's obvious for us, but I think that is going to start to become instinctively obvious for leaders of all businesses, what's, whatever sector you're, you're in. Um, resilience, but also agility. So, I mean, I, I joined the partnership five weeks before COVID. You know, yeah. the, job I, the job I joined today didn't exist six weeks after I'd been in post. Um, and, you know, whether you've been a seasoned retailer or whether you were new to retailer, you're, you're redefining as you go along. So that how you and the, the leadership ability to deal with ambiguity take your teams through ambiguity um for me i mean it's a very personal style but for me there's something very important about being very connected with your uh, your people your partners being very connected to your customers um so i have a council sort of big session twice a year of which um, I've had one very recently and there's always a session which is about so what's on partners minds what's on what's on colleagues minds um, and I always have a test for myself which is um, if I'm ever surprised by an issue that's raised by a partner I haven't done my job and there's never been an occasion when anything has been raised that I'm surprised by because I've always either directly or indirectly, I've, there's always been a conversation. So resilience, connectedness, um, uh, leadership with uh, and ambiguity, agility, connectedness. And also I think then, you know, we've all need, we all need routes that keep, that, that kind of top us up. Yep. Um, you know, so for me, I'm very lucky. 
I've been married forever. I've got kids who are now actually a joy to be with, which is, you know, thank gold. Um, now teenagers. Um, find, you know, setting yourself up early with sources of support. Um, I don't, you know, people describe them, it's not that they're lonely jobs. Yeah. I don't feel lonely, but there are jobs where um, it's very difficult to share the whole breadth of the role um, with with your with your colleagues by uh, by by nature of some of the facets. I think it's quite interesting because where you describe your council, so I do think your role is a unique role as a chair of a partnership mm-hmm. in the sense that you're having to listen to all your partners and you're carrying that. Yes. Right, whether it's emotion, thoughts, ideas, innovation, whatever it is, you're carrying all of that. And that's why I think you do need, in an organisation, might be slightly different because somebody in your role in a sort of typical corporate is listening to shareholders. And that, that conversation is a very different conversation. So I would guess that it's quite emotive yes. when, it's, when you're in your council sessions, which I would liken to an investor day, with, with the chair from a listed company where it might be slightly different. It's more about business strategy, returns, it's um, transactional, mechanical, financial, maybe more so, and obviously now more so on ESG. Whereas yours probably kind of the whole gambit of what you're carrying. It is, and even just the setup. So, I mean, the you know, as I say, I was there very recently in the sort of, so we've got sort of 60 council uh, councillors all on tables we might have 200 partners who were visiting and observing the meeting. It's live streamed. So you might have a thousand partners sort of watching you on the day or mm-hmm. streaming afterwards. There's live blogging and we have our own newspaper. So it's all, it's a very open and very transparent. And you're right, there'll be as many questions about, I don't know at the moment, IT resilience, supply chain, commerciality as, well, what's the partner difference? Why is it different being a partner? Sharon, explain to me why I should stay. What should, what should I say to my constituents? What's the future of co-ownership? What's the modernization of the you know, democracy? If we're, we're modernizing the operating model for the commercial side of the business, well, what's the analog for the democracy? And those two, two aspects, um, I mean, it doesn't quite divide 50-50, but it almost divides 50-50. Um, we talk about soul, we talk about emotion, we talk about the feeling of being a partner, we talk about belonging. Um, I talk a lot about, I mean, in my last council session, that we will have failed if we have a turnaround plan that any other retailer could have put together. But a turnaround plan, it's not, it's not difficult. You know, I can tell you where all the costs are, that's not the job. The job is that we come through this period and we still have the soul of being a different, not necessarily better, but a different form of business. And so it is a very, um, yeah, and 74,000 partners, there's not a homogeneous view. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, individual to individual, but Waitrose sometimes feels very different from John Lewis. The supply chain often feels very different. Shops feel very different. Um, our central teams. Uh, you know, even buying versus merchandising um, versus retail. Um, and you take all of that. And yes, it's, I would say it's sort of decision making by consensus, not because somehow, you know, you vote on every decision, but it's more the fact, and I've, you know, I've seen this through mistakes as well as successes, that if you take a decision that really doesn't sit well with the partnership, something goes wrong. You know, you basically sort of, you know, you sort of find yourself in this sort of massive debate for three months. And it's happened on tiny things, seemingly tiny things and seemingly huge existential things, which is the partnership is basically saying you've, you've either gone too far, or you haven't gone far enough. And it just sort of kind of bubbles through and then you sort of raise your hand and say you're right and you know we have a conversation we adjust things and that's the thing isn't it perspective and calibration it's is the exactly things. that's a much better way to, <laughs> to frame it it's basically it's perspective and then it's calibration it's exactly that but what you've described in terms of some of the competing challenges around 
making sure the partnership moves forward. It's not that different from what we see in corporates where, where the language is slightly different. It might be transformation for success, right? Transformation or evolution so that you're fit for the future. So a lot of what you talk about, and correct me if I'm wrong, the modernization that you're talking about is not about taking something and breaking it apart. It's about modernizing it so it's fit for the future. And I mean, that's what I'm getting the sense of in our conversation. No, completely that. I and mean, indeed, I'd go one step further, which is... Um, so I think for us it's about, I talk a lot about sort of historic values and modern transformation because in the, for us the business that we now need to be actually is really characteristic of our first 20 years as a partnership. Really? Much less so than our last 20 years. So those first 20 years, um, and the founder, the founder talked about the partnership as an experiment, which I love because, <laughs> you know, some experiments work and some experiments don't work. And you've basically got to work really hard to make sure your, your experiment works. And it conveys a sense of sort of positive anxiety, nervous energy. I mean, the partnership always went bankrupt countless times. And, you know, basically people had to sort of dip into their savings and not take their salary, basically to keep the partnership going. We didn't have a cash bonus until 1971, but we've been going since 1919. And so, and we had a much stronger sense of commerciality and efficiency. Uh, I, can't, I won't be able to remember the quote, but Speed and Lewis talked about, you know, to properly be a partnership, you have to be properly efficient. And I think we got a little bit less a bit less hungry actually as we got more steadily commercially successful and I think we have a moment to relive and regain that sense of sort of positive anxiety nervous energy sense of commitment and that's sort of jeopardy that is really galvanizing that takes us back to where we started and not quite those less hungry years where I wouldn't say it was I think we maybe just lost sight of the fact that we were an experiment that still well, needed to be worked at very successful experiment for many many years and I think it's really nice you talk about that nervous energy and I get a sense of real excitement and optimism I'm very optimistic um, and, and partly by personality I'm partly personality but, but actually also a vision you know about how you bring this on you talk about counsel you're clearly you know you're you're sort of really there to give guidance and direction and sort of really give comfort and confidence where do you get your guidance and uh, counsel from <laughs> um so some of it's some of it's um kind of inherent and like, as I say I talk to my background in more ways than I probably appreciated when I was first a young person working, uh, young person, younger person. <laughs> um, matters are quite religious, so I definitely have a sense that sort of, uh, you know, there is a, you know, there's a kind of higher purpose. I don't mean in a very sort of pious way, but that there, there's, you know, that t today isn't everything there is. Um, I've had I've been very lucky with people in my life, so um, I guess you talk about sponsors. But I've had, um, I mean, when I was a civil servant, somebody called Suma Chakrabarti, who was a few years ahead of me, and was just this sort of became a very close friend. But was just this amazing sort of role model. His parents, um, Indi Indian heritage. Um, was probably the first permanent secretary that ever worked flexibly because he was the prime uh, carer for his daughter. Basically at various points where I thought, oh my God, I've got kids and I can't work because my kids are so annoying when they were younger, particularly my younger son. I mean, he created a job for me that I could work four days a week when my younger son basically had, had some medical issues when he was younger. And has been a great friend since. I've had um, Nell Fitzgerald, who used to chair Unilever, has, I mean, I've never made a, a job decision uh, that I haven't sort of, oh, what should I do? Is this a good thing to do? And he's just, um, he comes in in a brilliant way, which is, yeah, I, I can I can tell, I can tell this one might be a little bit tricky, but comes in in a really, I'm quite practical. So I'm, I, so I'm less good with sympathy and I'm much better with, okay, where are you? And pros and cons and what a difference. He's just been fantastic. So, um, 
some of it's inherent, but actually having people in your life that know you well, what to say when, but also for me, sort of that kind of practical, practical nudge. That doesn't surprise me that you're an action orientated, uh, you know, person to get things done. Um, and if you could go back to your younger self, or if you could do anything differently, what would you do differently? Gosh, I am. Um, the thing is, I feel so lucky because my my life has been so mad. I mean, when I was younger, because I say I was sort of, you know, this really. I mean, I've always been slightly old. I mean, it was this very, very old, very nerdy, very religious teenager that sort of either wanted to be a nun in some, as a her. I had this sort of idea of sort of, you know, have this kind of meditative life or being a refugee worker and never thought I'd get married, never thought I'd had kids. And basically my life has turned out to be completely different. And, you know, I look even across the UK, I mean, how many people have had the ability to work in government, to work as a regulator and now, you know, very particular business. So... What would I have done differently? I don't know, I like the surprise and I like, I like not knowing. Um, and I think, you know, maybe the more the equivalent is when I talk to young people now and, I, and I'm always clear not to give advice um, other than to say, you know, it's a long life and be, having fun being kind and putting something back you know whatever your background there's always something you know today's conversation will live with me and I'll be able to I'll, I'll have different conversations because we've spoken today with my team with my family because it's a you've, you've provoked you've used phrases today you've provoked a different way of thinking so what will I give back? Because I've had the opportunity to have this amazing conversation today. So fun, kindness, and I don't know, I'm quite, I have quite a strong this sense of responsibility. And, right, that comes and, through and loud back. and clear, the sense of responsibility. And, it, you know, I guess if you went back to your younger self, would you have ever imagined you'd go from a very senior role in government into leading a regulator, into leading a, an incredible business now? And like you say, you don't know where your life takes you, but there's always a reason. And you're actually now making this huge impact societally as well through through the impact that you can have. So it's quite interesting. I the one thing I do want to pick up, you are an you know, you're an incredible role model. You're a celebrated female leader. Um, I think in John Lewis, you've got something like 60% of your leadership is, team is female. So that kind of almost, you know, that is the Sharon that I kind of imagine. Um, is there any learnings? That, so if I think about the FTSE Women's Leader Review that we, we're involved in as KPMG, and I think about some of the businesses that we work with, you know, 60% is incredible, right? 40% we're lucky. So anything we could take away that you're doing that think other business should, could take away? I always think share stories. I mean, it's interesting for us because we retail is 50, 55% female, um, basically in shops, and then it gets very, very male very, very quickly. Um, I think, I mean, I mean, but you're brilliant at this. I think it's all about... Um, I think it's all about leadership and passion if you believe in it if you will it it will happen because you you look in different places you have different conversations with headhunters you say there's no field you change your headhunter i mean the number of times you know and i've you know the great advantage of having um you know having been in the roles i have is that i've now had the confidence do you keep um you keep pushing, but the very fact that you're in the role you are, but also that you're doing the role in the way in which you're doing it, is going to attract both both men who've got different approaches to work, but also women who who can see that they can be themselves and 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 still get on. So I was I, was, I um I was, ran into one of my partners last week. Um, who works in Waitrose, we were just in the antechamber. I was coming out of a meeting, he was going in it. And I hadn't seen him for four years since I did a town hall meeting. And he said, oh, Sharon, how are you? And I said, no, no, super, super well. And he said, you know, remember, remember the first time I saw you and the thing I remember was that you were wearing um, training shoes. 
I think, in fact, I was wearing a jumpsuit and training shoes, both, both John Lewis. And he said, that really stayed with me because I suddenly thought, I don't know what she's like, but I know she's not the same. And I, and as I say, I hadn't, I mean, I hadn't sort of thought anything of it because um, actually there was a point when I was at Ofcom, I basically stopped wearing power suits and block dresses and basically started, started to dress for myself. And it just hadn't crossed my mind. And he said, four years later, and he said, I just stopped. I started dressing differently. Interesting. He said, because he suddenly thought, well, some, I don't quite know what it is. So it's, um, so it's, I just think there are different dimensions. So the talent you're looking for, the headhunters you use, um, some of the subliminal messages that you don't realize that you're, um, giving out, I think fundamentally, particularly because there's a, you will have a different degree of visibility and scrutiny. Fundamentally, knowing yourself and being yourself, and not somehow feeling that you've got to. You've got a role because you're you, and you're not literally dressing, being somebody else. I think all of those things matter hugely. It's empowering people to be, and like we say, we know everybody come as you are, and that comes back to your point of belief. You'll only, you'll only attract if yeah. people believe, and people believe if they see and they feel it. One final question for you, Karen. Um, what bit of advice would you give to your younger self? I just, I, I think it's as we talked before. It's a, you know, we're all going to be working till we're. 75, 80, there are no pensions, there's no, secu you know, there's no security in old age, and, and it's a long life where you can do good. Um, and I think that combination of doing what you love um, and doing good. Now, obviously, for you know, we're very lucky because we, our families are very lucky because um, they're more financially secure than the vast majority of people in the UK who are having to work because they need to pay the bills and need to buy food and all those things super, super important. But if you can do a job you love, so, I mean, I go back to my, my mother wanted to be a nurse. My mother worked in a factory for 50 years, um, sewing clothes, a job that she did not love and she wanted to be a nurse. And when she applied to be a nurse in the early 60s, she was told she couldn't go on the training because she had kids. And because she was a mother, she had to look after her children. And so she couldn't get on the nursing course. So her opportunity to do a job she loved, give back, was essentially, it was, it was thwarted, taken from her. And so my, you know, if there is any advice, it's sort of what's, what's, what's that equivalent? And there might be somebody saying, actually, that's not the job for you. But breaking through that barrier so that you can spend yeah. 30, 40, 50 years. It might be 10 jobs. It might not be one job that you love, is fun uh, and, and is worthwhile. Thank you very much for that. It comes through when I talk to you that fun is part of a very big part of your day. Um, but, you know, when you talk about do a job you love, lots of people often ask me, and I'm often saying, you know, you spend your working day, you make waking day in the office or, or wherever you work, make sure you enjoy it. And so I love the fact that you say do what you love because what we love changes and as our interests. Exactly. And, what and you as we love, mature. What you love changes. Yeah, as we mature as well. Um, but I think I would love to summarise this conversation in your words a long life to do good how lovely does how well does that capture everything that you stand for and we've covered so much in terms of responsibility and duty which comes through loud and clear in you as a person but also in the organization that you lead and in every interaction that we as consumers have right um, we talk about leadership qualities being around resilience and, you know, you've demonstrated that resilience, agility, connectedness. And connectedness doesn't come up very often, but I do think in this world of, 
you know, and I think it's also driven by the sort of societal connections that we have to interface with, whether it's intergenerational, whether in your case you've got consumers and you've got colleagues, inequalities. I think that connectedness is really important not to lose sight of what we're all here for. Um, and you really do espouse what you talk about, which is kindness and decency. You talked about sharing stories, and I think that is very powerful because... Even if you listen to people's stories who don't appear to be like you, there will always be something that resonates. And that is the connector, coming back to your connectedness point. That's what connects us, something in each other's stories. But thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. It's been fantastic.